Hello, hello and good evening everybody. Uh, a big warm welcome to you all on this blustery evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Zoe Lyons. I'm going to be hosting you through this evening. This is the, the second of a, a series of online talks uh, centered around Beneath the Waves, brought to you by the Marine Conservation Society. And uh, just so delighted that so many of you have decided to tune in and join us. I can see from the chats that we have people from Suffolk. Well done. Uh, but I think, uh, is it Vary or Mary in the in Harris Outer Hebrides? I think you win this evening uh, as person tuning in from furthest afield. But you're all very, very welcome. Bristol. Or Wiltshire, all of you there. How nice. It's fantastic. Hey on hey on why? Oh, a charming place. A charming part of the world. Glasgow and Turkey. Sorry, Barry, you've been beaten. Sorry, you've been uh, pipped at the post by Turkey right at the end there. Um, but delighted to have you all here. Uh, it, now, if you haven't already completed the, the first of our polls this evening, please do. Uh, you should be able to see it on your screen. Uh, this evening's talk is about Forever Chemicals, and this is our initial question. Have you ever heard of Forever Chemicals, and what do you know of them? So get, get posting on that, and we shall come back to that a little bit later on. Um, now, these things are always better when you interact, so we, of course, welcome questions from you. Um, and uh, please deposit those in the little Q&A box you see down in the down in the bar at the bottom, you'll see a Q&A. That's for your questions down there. You can also use that if you have any technical problems and uh, one of our members of staff will do their best uh, to endeavor to help you. I would say turn it on and off again. That would be my advice, but I'm not a technical expert. Uh, also, we've got the chat box there, which you're familiar with, you've seen that already. Any other comments can go in there. And uh, we will also be posting links in there for various things we'll be talking about so that you can go off and explore later on. And most importantly, sign the petition if you haven't already. Um, the, the webinar is being recorded and a link of that will be sent to you later on. Uh, so yeah, let me introduce myself properly. My name is Zoe. I am I'm a stand up comedian by trade. Uh, and uh, this is Percy, Percy the Puffer, and uh, I'm a very proud ambassador of the Marine Conservation Society, uh, which I have been now for uh, nearly two years, I believe. Uh, I, I came to join it in a bizarre way. I uh, I did an episode of Mastermind where my su my subject was uh, Jacques Cousteau. So I decided to donate my winnings, if there were any, to the Marine Conservation Society. And a relationship was struck up since then. And it's been such a pleasure to, to be with these people and work with them ever since. I'm very lucky. I live by the sea. I've always loved the sea. I grew up in Ireland on the, on the coast down there. So as a kid, spent every day gazing out at the ocean. I now live in Brighton and uh, yeah, do very much the same. I'm a massive scuba diver. That's that's a huge passion of mine. I started scuba diving about nine years ago and uh, really changed my, A, it changed my life and B, it changed my, my view and appreciation and just wonder of our incredible oceans and uh, made some lifelong friends, including Percy here. Uh, he's delighted to be here. You can see he looks like he's actually attacking me, but he's not. We're, we're on very friendly terms. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, and I now when I don't go scuba diving, I go sea swimming. So I'm very connected to the ocean. And I appreciate it in every way, shape and form. And I know that you obviously do as well. And that's why you're here with us this evening. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce our, our brilliant speaker this evening. It's uh, Francesca. Hello, Francesca. Hi, Zoe. How are you, How are you doing? I'm not too bad. I'm, I feel a bit jealous. My uh, my whale doesn't have a name. I think uh, oh. the camp hate whale needs a name. Maybe that can be something people. Well, put, can put that in, in the chat. chat. But we need a, we have a, we have a nameless whale here. So uh, any any recommendations will be taken on board. Um, <laughs> and and you are you are a, a policy and advocacy manager of chemicals for the Marine Conservation Society, and. You know, you're going to talk us through Forever Chemicals or PFAS, as they're also called, um, what they are, why we have them and why we don't want them anymore. So I'll hand over to you, Francesca. Thank, thank you very much, Zoe. Thanks. Um, and yeah, thank you, everyone, for, for coming this evening. Um, I just wanted to start by saying as well that we really want this to be as interesting and as informative as possible. Um, so please don't shy away from the Q&A box, just there's no such thing as a silly question, 
whatever questions you can come up with would be brilliant. Um, uh, so yes, anyway, my name is Francesca Bevan and I am a chemical pollution specialist here at the Marine Conservation Society and I'm going to talk to you tonight about forever chemicals or like Zoe said, like PFAS. Um, so before I kick off with a very short presentation, um, it would be good to have a look at the poll results just to see where we are. Oh, there's okay. a good split. <laughs> yeah. What have we got there? So 45% saying I've heard of them, I know what they are. 34, I've heard of them, but don't know what they are. And 21%, I have never heard of them. So, okay, yeah, that's quite interesting. It's a good, good spread, but uh, hopefully you'll either learn something or um, or just find it find it interesting. But yeah, any questions you can think of, make sure you drop them in the box. But I'm just gonna share my screen again and uh, a short presentation. Um, so when I say pollution, quite often the images that come to mind might be maybe plastic pollution, um, sewage, uh, especially of, of, of recent news, um, maybe an oil slick out at sea, or um, maybe even green fluorescent radioactive waste. But what we often don't consider are the thousands of invisible chemicals that are in our everyday products, um, chemicals that we might consider to be completely harmless, or we just might not think about them at all. So what are these forever chemicals um, and why are they used in all our products? Well, this, the particular group of chemicals that I'm talking about tonight are, called, are also called PFAS. And it's a very, very large family of different but very similar chemicals. Um, the most recent estimate that I know of um, has suggested that there's about 6,000, probably even more, different um, chemicals in this group. And to put that into perspective, at the moment, only two are banned in the UK. So two out of several thousand are banned at the moment. But what is the problem with PFAS, with forever chemicals, um, you might ask. If they're invisible, why, why do we care so much about them? Um, as the name suggests, forever chemicals, they're very persistent. They don't break down in the environment. They stay there forever for thousands and thousands of years. And because we keep using them, they're building up all around us all the time. They're building up in our environment, in wildlife and in us. And because they can move around so easily in water, they are spreading all over the globe. And currently they're not removed from wastewater and obviously the, it's not impossible to remove them from the environment. Um, and these, these forever chemicals have already been found in the blood and livers of many, many animals. Um, and they've been linked to a numerous um, health effects in animals as well. Um, so they've been, they've been linked to a weakened immune system and hormone imbalances in marine mammals neurological impacts in polar bears, thyroid disease in seabirds. The list is extensive of the impacts that these chemicals can have. And I'm not going to go into them into detail now, um, but if you want to read about the very specific impacts, we've got a lot of information on our website. But what is potentially even more shocking is that these chemicals were only first introduced in the 1950s. And a very recent scientific study that came out only a few weeks ago said that they're now in water all around the globe, from the North Pole to the South Pole, in rivers, Arctic ice, sea spray. They've been found in every drop of rainwater on Earth. And at some, in some places, the levels in rainwater are so high that it wouldn't be considered safe to drink in some countries. And often these chemicals are being found in water miles from any activities that use them, dispose of them, manufacture them, anything. And so these, these chemicals, these forever chemicals that last forever in our environment are everywhere. And we're continuing to use them in such vast quantities in so many of our products and processes that the problem is just getting worse. And this is just one specific group of chemicals there's estimated to be around 350,000 different man-made chemicals on the global market at the moment. And they're not all bad. 
but it just puts into perspective the scope of this problem, the scope of this topic, and I don't think it's really recognised quite, quite as much as other topics. So this was where our Stop Ocean Poison campaign came in and it launched a few weeks ago. And because of the scope of this topic and because these chemicals are, are everywhere, we were calling on the UK government to, to put better protections in place, to better protect wildlife, us and the planet from these harmful chemicals by, by banning these forever chemicals, but also introducing a strategy to an overarching strategy to to tackle these problems at source, to tackle these, this chemical pollution at source. Um, and we were asking our supporters and members of the general public to sign a petition. Now, excitingly, um, I checked this evening and the petition is very, very, very close to 10,000 signatures. So we're at, I think it was 9,800 and something last time I checked. Um, so if you haven't signed it yet and you would like to, there, there is a possibility that we would get to 10,000 during our webinar this evening. Um, but yes, I'm going to stop sharing again. Um, and I think we're going to move on to another poll. Yeah, I think we have another poll coming our way. So um, I'm going to get you to think a little bit here now, folks. Uh, can you guess where forever chemicals might be found? So this is a multiple choice question for you. Uh, cosmetics, pizza boxes, raincoats, paint, firefighting foam, non-stick pans, or all of the above. Um, yeah, because if you haven't heard of these chemicals, uh, Francesca, like a lot of people have, you yeah, you might be completely unaware that everyday items that you are using uh, contain them. Yeah. Yeah. No, definitely. And yeah, being invisible too. <laughs> so please vote away. Put, put your uh, put your little brains to test there. Um, I've got an early question that's come in. Have you already, would you like a question at this point? Yeah, let's go for um, it. <laughs> well, Felicity would like to know which countries are most impacted by forever chemicals, i.e. in rainfall? Um, that's quite an interesting question because you said that they're, they're absolutely everywhere now and places that have, don't even use these chemicals predominantly. So is are there parts of the planet that are, you know, worse, worse affected? Um, I mean, like I said in the presentation, it is very much a global problem. Um, mm -hmm. They are spread everywhere. Um, generally, close places that are closer to um, the manufacturing and, and vast amounts of use and disposal would be worse. Um, but I think a lot of it comes down to the monitoring that actually goes on. So yeah. what countries are looking at whether there is a problem. Um, so the United States have done, they do a lot of monitoring, a lot of bio monitoring and, and a lot of other things like that to, to look at the, the scope of the problem. Um, and there, there was a lot of issues in the States with manufacturing, you know, they did a lot of manufacturing of PFAS. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, so I, I, don't, I wouldn't say that the certain countries are necessarily worse affected. I think it is spread globally um, and it, and it continues to spread globally. The more we use them, the more we, we release them. It, it's just carrying on across the globe. So another question I have here for you from Andy. Uh, do PFAS concentrate on micro and nanoplastic in the ocean? I um, I, I believe they, they can. Um, I, I don't know of any studies um, off the top of my head. Um, but I, I believe a lot of persistent organic pollutants, which the the forever chemicals, the PFAS fit under that umbrella. Yeah. Um, I, I believe they, yes, they, they can do. You said there were two that were banned out of, out of what, 6,000? And probably more. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm, I'm interested to know why those particular, why two out of 6,000 when they clearly are so destructive and so persistent? Uh, are, yeah. are, are, are um, some worse than others? I think it's more a case of what evidence there is. So the first one was banned in 2009, um, and then the next one wasn't banned until 2019. And funnily enough, the second one was introduced pretty much to replace the first one. <laughs> um, oh. And this, this is the kind of rate of chemicals regulation 
um, in this country where we ban a chemical when there's enough proof to say this is causing all of these effects, we must ban it. And then we it gets substituted with another very similar chemical. And then we just we sort of go through this whole process. But obviously with 6000 chemicals, that's going to take quite a, a long, long time. time. <laughs> quite a long time. Um, so yeah, keep voting away on that. I don't know when, when are we going to see the results of that. Um, I think now. I think shall we have a little Mitch look. A Let's have a look. See, good spread. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what is the correct answer? So I'm just going to share my screen again. Um, so it was, it was kind of a trick question because they were in all of the above <laughs> unfortunately they were in everything and many many more that was just a very small selection um that i picked out of the of the massive long list and this is this list on on my screen now is not even a comprehensive list this is just uh, just a few examples um they are in one sense they are wondrous chemicals they they are resistant to water, to oil, to grease, to heat, um, to chemicals. They, they are resistant to so many different things that it makes them very useful for a lot of different applications. Um, so they can be used in nonstick frying pans. That's one that quite a lot of people have heard of. Um, they're used to add stain resistance, uh, waterproofing. And then that's just the products in our homes. They, you know, they're used in manufacturing. They're, they're, the uses are extensive and I can guarantee we will all have PFAS, these forever chemicals in our home right now. Yeah. <laughs> You're probably wearing some or sat on some. It's um, yeah, it is, it is extensive. <laughs> so bearing in mind how extensive they are, is, is it, is it possible, do you think, to get rid of them, to, to stop using them, to replace them with something else? There's, there's never going to be, um, something to replace them all with an equal with something that would would be able to be used in nonstick pans waterproof coats cosmetics because if there was it would likely have the same problems because they're as, as good as they are at all of these things at making things waterproof and stain proof that is their that is their environmental downfall because it also makes them very resistant to environmental degradation so because they can't break down in the environment that's that's one of the big problems. Um, but there are alternatives for each of the different uses. Um, and, uh, you know, I think in a lot of instances, it's it's relatively easy to replace um, these forever chemicals with other other not as harmful things. So it's sort of us. To, it's up to us as sort of consumers and users and uh, to to adapt and and modify our use of them. Yeah. yeah. So, so we, we're not saying that you'd have to get rid of your co cosmetics completely. You're not saying you'd have to sort of get rid of your anoraks. There are alternatives. Definitely, yeah. I mean, and it, it shouldn't be down. It shouldn't be down to consumers at all to to find those alternatives. You know, it, when we look at all of these items, you, you would have no way as a as a consumer to know that that your items have these chemicals. You know, even as a chemist, I can't I can't know that yeah. they're that my products contain PFAS. I can take a good guess at some of them, but the only time where chemicals have to be labelled um, in general in a consumer product is in cosmetics. Um, and other than that, you, you have no way of knowing. Yeah. So that that's why they shouldn't be in consumer products to begin with. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I've got some more questions for you here coming in the Q&A. Remember to use the Q&A little bit down here at the bottom. That's great. Um, so, yes, I think you've just answered this one from uh, Radha. Do labels say the product contains PFAS? So, no, that's, it's, that's, the, that's the issue. We're unaware of what we're, we're being sold and what we're, being, what we're consuming. Yeah, and, and I think the other thing is we... So, um, in outdoor clothing, quite often, you, you might see the phrase PFC free. Um, and this is when it gets even more complicated because there's more acronyms. Um, but PFC stands for, quite often stands for polyfluorinated compounds, which is for all intents and purposes, the same thing as, as PFAS, these forever chemicals. Um, and because they, they, 
the um, outdoor clothing brands use this as a label, use PFC free as a label. Um, that is one area that you sometimes can tell whether they have um, they have PFAS or not. But it, it just gets it gets very complicated very quickly, yeah. unnecessarily complicated. Yeah, yeah. And, and you and we went going back to the point that there, there were two banned in this country. Uh, how do we? Jim wants to know how we compare to the EU or elsewhere with banning. Uh, so yeah, um, are they more on it? Are they are they more active in in reducing its numbers and its impact? Yeah, so the EU um, committed a, a couple of years ago now. I think in twenty twenty they committed to removing all PFAS from all non-essential uses. Um, so basically they P PFAS are used in some medical equipment. So they're used in catheters, um, they're used in a lot of PPE. And so the EU took the tax that certain uses will be essential, things like medical devices. If there is no alternative to these chemicals, then by no means they should be they shouldn't be used in that in those cases. But then when we look at our consumer products, especially when there are alternatives that are readily available, yeah. we, we shouldn't be using these chemicals in our products. And especially when it comes to, you know, the, these these chemicals are used in pizza boxes and fast food packaging that are throwaway items. And, you know, they're, they're used once and then chucked on, you know, yeah. even even if they get recycled, they, they're still chucked on a heap and potentially leaching leaching all these chemicals into the environment yeah yeah i know because when we talked before this webinar and you 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 you, you told me where you know where these chemicals were found i was absolutely gobsmacked and then now now that you started to, now that you told me about it i see them every i'm like oh it's the pizza box it's the you know it's um yeah it's it's, it's it is quite alarming and of course as you said, if the, if if these chemicals are then turning up in the anatomies of of animals, they're turning up in our anatomies as well. So, from a, if you were to take a selfish standpoint, then we have to look after us. That has to be, you know, the 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 environment, uh, animals, and ourselves as human beings, because we won't know what the long term effects of these building up inside us will be. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose I suppose with a lot of these things as well, people get overwhelmed with the um implications and impacts and it's quite easy to feel helpless in situations like this where you think well what's the point well you know um but, but are you confident that if there is you know stricter controls on them and more bans on these chemicals that things will improve over time definitely i think i think the key is is action and, and quick action urgent action to stop it getting any worse i mean yeah. another good example that a lot of people um have heard of before are cfc's uh, chlorofluorocarbons <laughs> which were used in refrigerators um yes. and they were linked to the hole in the ozone layer um, yes. i know it was sort of big news a while ago and you don't really hear too much about it now but cfc's were banned and it was it was under the same kind of premise as the non-essential uses type type thing that we're going for with with pfas and it's, it's actually the hole in the ozone layer is improving and it's and it has been linked directly to stopping stopping the widespread use of cfc's so banning chemicals does work um yeah. but it, it just needs urgent joined up action yeah yeah and on that note karen has a question for you she says um uh, i think you might have already answered this but but can pfas be safely recycled disposed of will they leach out of products during normal use or an incorrect disposal at the end of the product's life um that this is the major problem so is there any form of recycling or correct disposal of them <laughs> Unfortunate. Well, um, OK, there's, there's kind of two sides to this argument. Up until very recently, the only real route of disposal or, or sort of removal was incineration. Um, oh, right. But then obviously that has issues with air pollution and, you know, it's a whole kind of circular, circular thing that just it keeps going round. Um, one difficulty is the removal of these chemicals from the item they're in 
from the water, from, you know, there's so many different ways that they can get into the environment that it makes the removal of them very difficult. Um, so that's obviously the first problem. Um, there has been some research done very recently and they have been able to break apart some of the chemical bonds and, and there is a potential way of destroying them that's a much, much safer than incineration. Hmm. But the problem with it is you have to you have to be able to capture all of that, all of these chemicals somehow to yes. then treat. And it, it, yeah, because because they're invisible, because they are, you know, tiny molecules that they're, they're not they're not physical pieces of litter that we can sort of deal with in the physical sense. Um, and it's a very it's very complex and. And, and like I said, they're just they're so widespread and they they get into the environment in so many ways that it's yeah, it is nigh on impossible. And do, do, do you think that's why I suppose, yeah, that invisibility we're, we're very I know, I know that when I go scuba diving or when I go swimming in the sea, I'm very aware of plastics that I can see rubbish that's in front of my eyes things that I can actually pick up and have an effect on, you know, bag it and take it away. Um, is this why this has been, uh, because prior to speaking to you before this webinar, I wasn't aware of these chemicals. So uh, getting this knowledge out there and the educating people on this is hugely important, I would imagine, hugely important. Definitely, definitely. And I think, because um, I get this question quite a lot about, you know, can we do anything as individuals or can, you know, what what should I look out for? And I think one of the main things is talking about it um and it kind of sounds a bit silly but i think um another chemical um just to give a few sort of chemical examples that people might have heard of a lot of people have heard of bpa or you might have seen bpa free water bottles or bpa free babies bottles you know there's like and that only came about because of the uproar around the issues with bpa and that a lot of that was from a sort of general public conversation um, and nobody's really talking about PFAS um, in the same way uh, same as phthalates a lot of people talk about phthalates um, you see it on sort of shampoo bottles phthalate free or you know it's this... oh yes yes yeah yeah and I, I think we really want to start that same conversation with PFAS yeah well Colin Colin Moffat has asked why PFAS is against PCBs or PBDEs or SCCPs, like PSs, etc. Colin, Colin knows his chemicals. I think yeah. Colin knows his chemicals. Yeah. No, yeah. I mean, yeah, it, it kind of makes the point, doesn't it, as well? You know, this is this is such a big problem, um, you know, away from just PFAS as well. PCBs are a, a very good example. So PCBs are a group of industrial chemicals. So they, they were never really used in consumer products. And they were, for the most part, banned in the 1980s, I believe. Um, but they were very persistent. They didn't break down in the environment. They're still here today. Yeah. And in fact, we are now seeing the true impacts of that pollution because the UK killer whale population hasn't had a calf in 20, 25 years. And it's likely that that whole population of killer whales is tending towards a complete collapse in the next hundred years because of that PCB pollution. But it's too late to do anything about that PCB pollution because th there could be remediation efforts, but the effects are already being felt. But 30, 40 years later than we ever realized. Um, and that's, you know, we, we need to take these lessons from the past and learn that these chemicals, that anything that doesn't break down into the in the environment is is probably going to be a problem at some point in the future. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have another question here for you: Is PFAS included in the Stockholm Convention? Um, so the two I mentioned, the P, so the two that are banned, the PFOS, it's called, and PFOA. Um, loads of acronyms. It's it's horrendous. Um, they are both included in the Stockholm Convention and so the Stockholm Convention for anyone um, who isn't aware is a global um, convention, a global treaty, I uh, can't think of the words now, and they basically concentrate on these persistent organic pollutants, so 
things, persistent things that stick around in the environment forever, things that don't break down easily. Organic is just, it's, it's a chemical term. And then obviously pollution, stuff that shouldn't be there. Mm. Um, so these persistent organic pollutants are included in the Stockholm Convention and they get banned across the most part of the world. Yeah. And uh, 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 here's, a, here's a question that's it's, uh, close to my heart because it, re it refers to water companies. And uh, yes, I'm dealing with Southern Water down here and their, um, their enthusiastic use of letting sewage into the sea. Uh, so uh, Ian says, UK water companies are now obliged to risk, uh, risk assess all of their drinking water sources for 47 different PFAS compounds. Is that correct? Is that um, yes, uh, so I think our, I can't remember the exact numbers now, um, but I'm going to assume that's correct. Um, the, um, so they, they do get assessed. Uh, unfortunately, our levels in our drinking water are, are high, uh, not the levels of PFAS, but the level at which we set the safe level is higher than other countries. Um, the United States have recently dropped the level that is safe in their drinking water. Um, to m a lot further below ours, um, and and that's something else. You know, we need to we need to realise that these chemicals that because they are persistent, they build up, um, they build up in us, they build up in wildlife, they build up in the environment, and that that's going to have an effect at some point. Um, so we do monitor for you know a good a good chunk of PFAS now, not mm. all of them, but a, you know a good selection. Um, but it's about what do we do when we realise actually the levels are getting too high. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I'm just we're getting a lot of questions in here, Francesca. So I'm just scrolling through them to make sure that I don't miss anything. Keep keep sending them. I'll do my very best to get through them. There's a lot of them, so thank you. It's great that you're so engaged with this. Um, it's a huge problem that. Um, that absolutely needs addressing and if you haven't already signed the petition uh it takes seconds just go to the marine conservation uk website and uh, it literally takes seconds to sign the petition and um get the government to take stronger action against these chemicals um somebody's else so julie's asking here apart from signing the petition <laughs> what else can we do immediately to help immediately um share on social media talk to people tell people about these chemicals tell them why they're a problem but at the same time don't don't take it upon yourself to have to start looking around your house you know i i've i've known about these chemicals for a few quite a few years now a few years now and i i i still use non-stick pans I, i've still got waterproof coats that have probably got PFAS on them I I haven't gone around my house and sort of <laughs> purged all of my PFAS <laughs> belongings um because I don't think that that isn't an uh, that isn't the answer to this problem the answer is pushing on the government yeah. and on and on industries that use these chemicals to say we really shouldn't be using them especially yeah. when they're not especially when they're not necessary you know these, these should be we should stop being so kind of yeah just using them as much as we want are they used because they're cheap are they cheaper than alternatives is that why they're used so so frequently i think in some instances i think in as a chemist speaking they are like magnificent chemicals you know yeah. they are wondrous like i said in my presentation to have something that it can be both water and grease resistant is quite amazing and they that is why they're used so broadly because they are so brilliant yeah. but like i said that that's what makes them so damaging so i think there is an element of cost definitely um but i think as well they're just they are just good at what they do um but then the cost of convenience shouldn't come at the cost of the environment and our health and and wildlife's health yeah and on the, and on that point catherine wants to know is there a big resistance from the chemical industry to change is that where the heels are being dug dug in? Is that is that a point of you know? Yeah, just... point contention. <laughs> yeah. Um, so they they kind of 
I mean, this is a very generalized, you know, the chemical industry is huge, so I don't really want to speak on behalf of the entire chemical industry, but they, um, the American chemical, um, uh, I can't think of the acronym now, um, American Chemical Society, I think it was, released a, a graphic a couple of years ago, and I should have, I should have put a picture in my presentation, but they compared groups of chemicals to berries. So they said to berries to berries. OK, so they said just because holly berries, for example, are poisonous to humans doesn't mean we stop eating strawberries, raspberries, blueberries, blackberries. But then my argument was if we ate a berry and it like a holly berry and it killed us, mm -hmm. we'd probably stay clear of other berries until we found out that they were safe. Yes. <laughs> until we were 100 percent sure that they were OK to eat. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure how well their uh, their analogy stood up, but uh, but that's the kind of tack they're taking that just because one's bad doesn't mean they're all bad. But then we're saying they're very similar, so they're likely to, to all be, be quite bad, <laughs> be quite nasty, yeah. And then yeah, you should have to prove a hundred percent that they're not bad, and then we can use them. <laughs> and would chemical industries, would chemical manufacturers just? Would they stand to lose a lot of money if they if they went down this road of find of? I suppose they would, wouldn't they? They would. They, 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 yeah, you've got big industry that would potentially lose lots of money. So, yeah, I mean, I think big changes in legislation will always will always cost. Um, yeah. But then I think it's it's a case of we need to act now before the untold consequences become too bad and there is no going back from it and you know we're seeing this all the time with other crises with climate and, and other things like that you know this isn't one on its own um but it's just a case of action is needed and it's needed asap yeah yeah um russell is asking this is an interesting a few people have asked a similar sort of question so i'm going to use russell's is there a natural alternative for manufacturers to replace pfas within their products i think somebody mentioned seaweed at some point i don't is there a magical natural alternative unfortunately not like like i said it there is there wouldn't be one there wouldn't be a safe alternative that could replace pfas in yeah. all the different uses I think it's more about breaking it up into, you know, where is it necessary? So, for example, I, I was speaking to someone once about um, about some swimwear, mm -hmm. and they they used a PFAS coating on the swimwear, and then they realised actually it's not necessary because swimwear is supposed to be wet. <laughs> it's supposed yeah. to get wet. <laughs> it doesn't need to be water resistant, and it was just an unnecessary application in the fabric mill that they didn't they weren't even aware was being put on you know and it, it wasn't it so it wasn't even not only was it not essential it wasn't it wasn't needed in that product yeah. at all <laughs> yeah. and it could just be removed um so there are things like that and then there are things that could be replaced as well uh mary wants to know i, think, I hope i pronounced your name right mary mario Vary. it's scottish so it's a scottish scottish spelling up there in in the outer hebrides um have there been any industrial or non-industrial lawsuits regarding damage to health or environment related to pfas yeah um not in the uk um in the usa um there was a big one so i don't know if any of you have heard of the film dark waters ah yes but that was a big lawsuit brought by um, a village where the chemical uh, DuPont, the um, chem the PFAS manufacturer in this particular town, had been releasing some of the PFAS. This was this was prior to any of them being banned. Um, was releasing PFAS waste into the local waterway, and rates of all sorts of horrific diseases were through the roof in this in this particular town. And so they took DuPont to court and, and they did win a big, a big lawsuit. Um, and I think there are a lot, a lot of lawsuits being taken in the US um, on this, on PFAS specifically. That's interesting. And, and uh, does it follow historically that where, when things happen like this in the States, that we then follow on from that in this country? And... 
I mean, I think I think the difficulty is they do a lot of um, so what they do a lot of monitoring, a lot more monitoring of um, of of everything, not of all chemicals, but of all different sort of aspects mm. over there in terms of PFAS. Um, so they they can see where the problem is coming from, where it's where it's having an impact on the population and and things like that. And and yeah, we ju we just don't do that same level of of especially human monitoring over here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, with that, we've got an anonymous question down here. Um, uh, regarding, obviously, the food chain and uh, those of us that eat fish, are we putting ourselves at risk, a greater risk by eating fish that, have, you know, that are containing these chemicals? I think the thing is, like I said in the presentation, these, are, these chemicals are everywhere. They are in our drinking water. They are in also you know all different sources of food um that they, they are they are everywhere we breathe them in we we are exposed to them through our skin it, there isn't one source as such that is like particularly much worse than another you know there there are just so many different sources and i think that is why it is so crucial that we have to stop them we have we we call it stopping at source we have to turn the tap off on this pollution to stop it getting any worse and to stop it being in our food and our drinking water and I think that it's it's kind of taking a step back and just looking at the bigger picture overall and and thinking yeah th this isn't this you know you can't stop eating certain things or mm. stop drinking water <laughs> it's <laughs> that's just not realistic but that's why that's why we have we are urging the government to to put a to put a stop to the uses of these chemicals yeah Absolutely. And you mentioned in your, in, your, in your presentation as well, you know, evidence of of, of poor um, physical health in polar bears and neurological damage, etc. Have there been any studies on, you know, human um, uh, the effects on humans health as a result of these chemicals, as causes of cancer, for example? Janet's asking a question. Uh, uh, could these could these chemicals be associated with cancers in people or animals? Yeah, I mean there there have been a lot of studies. I don't work um, too much on the human health side. Obviously, we're a marine charity, so we do focus on that. But I do work with a lot of other charities um, that have a bigger focus on on human health. So um, ChemTrust are a good website to use. Uh, Breast Cancer UK do a lot of work on PFAS. Um, really? uh, that's interesting yeah I work quite closely with them we, we've yes. sort of got a bit of a, a coalition of charities that work to, because it is such a it's such a vast area and oh. there are comparatively very few of us actually working on on you know in in the NGO world on these on this chemical pollution that we try to kind of tag team as much as possible and make sure that we're we're visible in all kind of meetings and government events and things like that so yes. um, yeah and he's asking a question he's saying are medical professions su su supporting this campaign so you're saying that there are charities associated with the with the campaign as well and um yeah that's it's uh, it's across the board yeah yeah breast cancer uk like i said the alliance for cancer prevention there's a few different health charities that um that we work quite closely with we did a uh, earlier this year we wrote a statement um, and it was signed, I think it was signed by uh, nearly 30 different uh, NGOs um, across environment and human health, urging the government to ban to ban these chemicals. Um, so that, that's on our website as well. Um, so you can see the range of charities there that signed up. Yeah, that's interesting. Because of course our, our bag is marine conservation, you know, it's the thing that we get excited about and it's the thing that we, we love. Um, but it's interesting to know that there are other charity campaigns out there promoting this as well. Um, and like I say, I think it's just so important because I consider myself a fairly well-read person who has an interest in things environmental, but I really wasn't, uh, you know, up to speed with the damage that these that these chemicals are doing and the urgency with which we need to get the government to make a change. It has to happen. It absolutely has to happen. Um, have we got time for any more questions? Let me see. We've got a few more. We've got lots coming in here, Francesco. Thank you so much for, for, for all of your insights. Um, 
uh, somebody here wants to know how many of these chemicals are used in creating renewable energy offshore energy systems such as wind farms well i'd imagine they're in that aren't they they're in everything aren't they, <laughs> they are, it's, it's, yeah. it's yeah, a, i don't I, I don't know off the top of my precisely. head. Precisely. I want to know yeah. precisely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised. Um, but yeah, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, I know in a lot of manufacturing, they're used as uh, lubricants and surfactants and things like that. So, um, but yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. Um, it's quite a specific question, that one, wasn't it? Um, uh... Oh, here's an interesting one from Mark. Is there a major brand that has banned PFAS from their supply chain that we can support? Yeah, um, so there have been quite a few more commitments I've noticed okay. than, than actual. So I don't know. Um, so I just uh, off the top of my head, I know, um, I think L'Oreal committed quite a few years ago now, actually. I think back 2019, 20 kind of time, they committed to remove all PFAS from their products. Starbucks, I think, very recently. Uh, McDonald's, maybe. There's there's quite a few. I just okay. I can think of like Guardian articles and stuff that, have, yeah. that I've read recently. Um, there are brands that are doing it across the board as well, across cosmetics, um, clothing, apparel, things like that, and um, and food packaging. There's um, yes, as someone's just put the PFAS free. Um, that's another charity we work with, Fidra, um, and they they list quite a few brands that don't have that don't have PFAS. Ah, great. Yes, yeah, somebody's put that in the chat for us, pfasfree.org. So go and check that out and have a look and you can make more informed decisions, I suppose, about what you're what you are purchasing. Um, uh, Elliot would like to know, are there any forever chemicals that are proven to be safe? It's a very loaded question. <laughs> the trouble is with, so when it comes to persistence, so the one thing that all of these forever chemicals have in common is they are all persistent. They don't break down in the environment. Yeah. And the problem with um, the problem with persistence, with this characteristic that they've all got, is if we carry on using them, they keep building up. And the thing that's that's common across all chemicals, across all any substance, is that at some point, that chemical will become toxic. Yeah. So for example, arsenic or something, very, very small amounts are toxic to humans. Chocolate, on the other hand, you need to eat like a kilogram, I think it is, of chocolate for it to be toxic, but it would get to a point where it's toxic. So when things are persistent and they build up and build up and build up, they will reach the point at which they are harmful. We just don't know necessarily yeah. where that point is. So although in small doses, these PFAS might be completely harmless. Just the fact that they are persistent is harmful enough. Eventually, we don't know when, could be tomorrow, could be 10 years. Yeah. They well, will that... reach a point of harm. And that's that's the problem with with these forever persistent chemicals. But also that reiterates to me why it's important to do something now, because there, there is hope. There is hope that, you know, it'll stay at a level that isn't harmful to us and that we can, you know. I am distressed to hear that chocolate is is harmful over a certain weight. That that has alarmed me. Um, I don't think I knew that. Uh, and as somebody who was eyeing up a four kilo Toblerone only the other day, uh, it made me think again. <laughs> four kilos, wow. It was quite a hefty Toblerone. It was quite a hefty Toblerone. I think you'd have to sort of loosen your lower jaw to uh, even attempt to eat it. But 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 it, but that in itself that has given me hope that okay they'll be there they'll be there forever but they might be at a level where we can deal with them and can carry on so that is why it is so important to make that change to make make government commitments. Um, yeah. Here we go. Should we take one? Take a couple more. Are you all right? Yeah, <laughs> it's brilliant. <laughs> Loads of good questions. There's some really good questions in here, aren't there? Let me let me get back to the top. Um, um blah, blah, blah. so uh natalie says uh where the eu is looking at updating reach regulations and pfas are a priority for them do you know if the uk government plans to follow any updates that are brought in unfortunately not um i think that's quite clear um so earlier this year um the uk released a what we call a consultation so they they put out they wanted to get gather some evidence from stakeholders about PFAS 
And so we responded to that saying pretty much what I've said today yeah. uh, with some effects and some evidence and whatever. And um, the result of that is expected any day now. Um, but we are hoping, we are hoping that there's going to be a much a much broader grouping approach, uh, you know, ban the whole group of PFAS, not not limit it to one or two at a time yeah. um, from this consultation that came out. Um, so the UK are definitely going, we're definitely going our own way. Um, <laughs> we have the potential, we have the potential to be world leaders in this. We really do. If, if we really, not we, if the government really cracked on with it, they, we, we could be world leaders. We could, do it quicker than the EU, but yeah. at the moment the EU are definitely definitely outpacing the rest of the world when it comes to um, to PFAS restrictions. Okay, yeah, yeah, we can but hope that the, <laughs> the government remember where they are and who they are, and uh, yeah, crack on with these things. Um, I think then it's time for us to launch our final poll um you've all been thank you so so much for sending in there's so many questions i'm sorry we haven't got to them all there's loads coming in um thank you very much getting us all to think and uh uh using francesca's brilliant knowledge here this evening so uh for a final time this evening uh forever chemicals do you feel like you know what forever chemicals are now um uh Yes, I have a very good understanding. Uh, I understand, but I have still some questions. Well, we know there's still loads coming in. Uh, um, I still don't really understand what they are. So if you could just fill that out for us, that would be great. Um, and then I think it just remains for it to say, um, you know, after, after this webinar, um, go to the website, sign the petition and indeed share it. We were so close to 10,000. Has signature. anyone checked it? Has anyone checked it? I don't know if it? anybody's checked it. We were very, very close to ten thousand signatures just before we came on online. So I, I reckon, with a strong wind behind us, uh, we'll be getting there. It's been creeping up. They said it's been creeping up, uh, and lots of thanks coming in for you as well, Francesca. Thank you very much for all these things. Uh, very insightful. Um, so great uh is there anywhere we can go where we want more information other than oh yes of course and you can use your little emoji oh look the people are using the little emoji reactions at the bottom thank you that's very lovely lots of applause coming in there so well done that's fantastic uh anywhere else people can go for more information yeah uh so we've got a section of our website that's dedicated to forever chemicals um there's all the stop ocean poison campaign pages um and we also have um a publication page on our website that is updated with any consultation responses so anyone who's interested in the more kind of regulation legislative side all our responses are on there yeah. um and any of the kind of more technical papers but if you just want a bit more information, yeah, there's a lot on the website. So, um, so take Go a look. Check <laughs> that out. So I don't know whether we've, are we able to launch the results of our final poll of the evening? There we go. Okay. <laughs> Lovely. 1%. I won't ask who you are. Uh, <laughs> do you feel like you know what forever chemicals are now? Yes, that's a, that's a vastly improved. Yes, 84%. I understand, but I still have some questions. That's 15%. Um, and, I, and I know there are lots of people with lots of questions. And, and, and do go and check out the website that Francesca has mentioned. Seek out the information. Um, you do start to see it a little bit more in news articles as well. I've seen it popping into my BBC news feed occasionally, um, articles on on on, uh, uh, on these chemicals. So, yes, yeah, seek it out. 1%, I still don't really understand what they are, but, you know, we did our best. I think we did our best. Um, go and seek out more information. Um, and, yes, I can only say again, please go to the Marine Conservation website and sign the petition. It does take seconds it really is very very simple um and uh and it'll be making a great uh, help and impact uh the the website is there in the chats uh www.mcsuk.org um and uh, i think I, I speak for everybody when i say thank you so much indeed for this. is there anything else you want to add you've you've covered you've been so brilliant at answering all of these questions a huge diverse range of questions coming in is there anything else you want to add or leave us with 
Um, I don't know. I think I just I know it's a very complex topic. I know it's quite heavy. Um, but just yeah, thank you everyone for listening. Thank you for the really good questions because I know it's not it's not always the sort of <laughs> the lightest of topics. Um, so yeah, th Percy thank you. Percy enjoyed questions. himself. <laughs> oh, we've had so. Oh, let well, that, what a nice way to finish. I think there were some suggestions for uh, for uh, names for your whale there as well. Uh, we had uh, Humphrey the humpback. Uh, oh yeah, like Humphrey. Yeah. yeah, is it a humpback though? I don't know. Uh... <laughs> Poor Humphrey, he's got. He's we've, got, got <laughs> we've got William the whale. <laughs> uh, Phelps the whale. Phelps. Bluey. Uh, and lots of Humphrey, Stephen the Drifter. There we go. That's um, yeah. quite surreal, but yeah, we'll go with. <laughs> My goldfish was called Phelps when I was a kid, so I might go with Phelps. <laughs> Good at doing laps, <laughs> just breaststroking around the castle. <laughs> Fantastic, lovely. Um, it's a huge thank you from both of us for. for sorry, there's thunder and lightning going on outside now as well. It's very, it's very dystopian. Um, a big, big thank you from from uh, Francesca and myself and everybody at the Marine Conservation Society uh, for you to you for joining us this evening. We really do appreciate you taking the time out and uh, educating yourself around PFAS or indeed you know joining in the conversation and asking all of those brilliant questions. So thank you so so much. If you have learned something, if you have benefited from from the webinar share your thoughts and insights with other people please send them the link to the petition um like i say we're very very close to reaching our goal of eleven thousand on that so it'd be much appreciated um and uh yeah all it remains for me to say is enjoy the rest of your evening uh enjoy your beautiful seas and oceans if they're around you and uh, and look after yourself and uh, and thank you so much francesca really appreciate it uh, thank you. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. Take care. Bye. Thanks so much.